and welcome to the Adepec Energy Dialogue Series, where I'll be guiding you through a series of conversations focused on the African oil and gas industry. My name is Olubumi Olajide, and joining me on this conversation is Mr. NJ Ayuk. He's the CEO of Centurion Law Group and a Pan-African Legal Advisory Conglomerate and the Executive Chairman of the African Energy Chamber. Thank you so much for making time for this conversation today. Thank you so much, Olu. It's uh, such an honor to uh, talk to you today. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to talk to you because there's been a lot of interesting developments around the African oil and gas industry. It, it has, it has. Who could, have, who could have thought we'll be where we are today? And uh, just, just to go right into the interesting developments, having worked with so many companies in the industry and they're, they, they're used to the cyclical nature of the oil and gas industry, it's, it's, it's basically built into their business models. How is this time different from most of the clients that you advise and you've seen so far in the last few months? This is very different um, from, on a lot of scales. Before you always saw how the market reactions, maybe you had a, a supply glut, or, and then we try to work some, on something to see that we ease the pressure on the markets and get the industry going again. But who could have thought, I was at the OPEC meetings in December last year, and we were all working to work with different OPEC members to see how we can balance the market and try to work on creating a very less volatile market. Who could have thought about a virus in the air that comes in, hits one of the, um, the largest energy consumer in the world, China, very hard, and then that virus comes into even oil fields in Africa and African, um, different African uh, countries that are just net importers or even exporters. I think the coronavirus, for whether you like it or not, has been the game changer um, coupled with other market factors that had come in and we dealt with the oil price crash where there was a big tussle between um, OPEC and non-OPEC member states led by Saudi Arabia and Russia. And you know, there's a whole African saying that when two elephants fight, it is the grass that's, that, that suffers. So we in Africa, we got the heat. We took, we, we took a lot of heat from this. And the, the COVID-19 and the oil market crash is something that we're going to go down in history books talking about this. So it's an exciting time to be on. Referring to one of your early interviews you had with Forbes in 2018, you actually said something very interesting, I think kind of reflects to this situation. You said uncertainty and volatility is a lethal disease in this industry and it's really bad for investment. Um, the last few months, have they cemented this, this, uh, this statement that you made or has it made you reconsider it in any way? It, it has cemented it more because you've seen, what are we seeing? You've seen a lot of projects in countries being put up. In places in Africa where we never thought in the past you're going to find so much oil, so much gas, they have been finding Uganda, Mozambique, Tanzania, Senegal. These are the so-called non-traditional oil and gas um, countries that are having new, new, new discoveries. But now in order to get those projects into FID so that everyday people can benefit, you need the markets and the right kind of market realities to make that happen. What happened, most of the projects have been delayed, postponed. We're still very lucky. It's the, a lot of them has not been canceled because international investors, which Africa relies on, they're looking at the markets. They're looking at what market factors are there and that determine things. So that's a problem. But let's go back to traditional oil states. If you look at Gabon, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Nigeria, Angola, you're not seeing the licensing rounds moving very fast. So investment into exploration is, it has, has basically stopped. And then you see investment into field development projects has, has taken a hit. So we have taken a hit, but you know, the other thing which you look, you look at, I always say, when the big players take a hit, when they have, a recession, we are in a depression. So this uncertainty has come in well in what I call uncertainty 2.0. And that is what you find right now in the market. And everyday Africans, I lead the African Indian Chamber, and we try to bring in concerns of everyday people. And everyday Africans are the ones really taking this hit. 
because you're seeing jobs going away, you're seeing contracts for local companies going away. I mean, you have to really have to think twice when you're discussing local content during this time, but that has, was supposed to be the bedrock in getting Africans to become true equal, and equal participants in this industry. So that uncertainty has been really bad, coupled with the oil um, price crash. So a lot of African projects are taking a hold. And it's not just oil and gas. And people just think it's all is oil. It is, the, it is the transition, whether it is power projects or non-oil projects, our hotels. Nobody is even coming to our hotels. Nobody is visiting our tourist, tourist destination because there's no liquid, there's no cash. And that is really what we face with these kind of uncertain dynamics that we find ourselves today. And you kind of alluded to it in your earlier statement, but many African countries prior to this, you mentioned a few with Nigeria and Mozambique and Angola, and quite a few of them really invested or they bet really heavily in the LNG markets growing over the next two years. And now that you have everything that's going on, how is this going to affect them, especially when it comes to investments coming in? And is there anything that they can do right now to make those investments a bit easier to release in this period right now? I think it's something we've, 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 we've talked a lot about in the chamber. This is time for you to look at market-driven solutions. You can't have cut and paste socialist solutions to address these, these uncertain times. You have to take a step back and say, where do I stand? How is the market? Stop thinking a lot about, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. I had a conversation with an African president and I said, Mr. President, when you get in that room with the investors, don't ask them, don't tell them what you are doing or what you want to do. You ask them the, the, the very pertinent question, what do you need from me to do to make you invest, put your money? What do you need from me to make you drive these gas projects and these new projects up? LNG is going to be Africa's game changer. Take, for example, a country like Nigeria. You had in Nigeria um, seven LNG trains. We talk about gas and everything. That has been the most successful project in Nigeria when it comes to the natural resources. Seven LNG train, last year almost $1.5 billion in net profits. It's going very well. And like what you say in Africa, no wahala, no drama coming out of there. It's going very well. We need more of that. We need to translate that. But right now, we need to start looking at real policy initiatives. You know, I tell you something, Olu. We're competing today in Africa, not just for dollars between um, Port Harcourt and Malabo and Dakar and Maputo. We are competing with new oil producing countries in like Suriname and Guyana. They are coming strong. They're having some of the best fiscal terms, some of the best attractive terms and everything. In a time of energy transition, we need to get back to the basics, the fundamentals. Are the fundamentals there? Are those fiscal, those fiscal terms really making it um, possible to incentivize investment and incentivize growth? So we need to get back to the playing book in Africa and say, how can we incentivize this industry? But still doing that in a sense where you say, you don't give up on the local industry. The local industry has to succeed. You still boost local content while incentivizing international companies to invest in, in the content. We need to look at that. We need to look at our taxes, our tax bracket. They affect all Africans as well as international companies because our continent has changed. Now you get Africans going from you know, South Africa into Nigeria, from Nigeria into Zimbabwe, from, from uh, Ghana into Angola to invest. So international tra tax dynamics and cross-border tax issues is something that is not just a Western, it's not just for the Western, it's also for Africans. So we need to look at those things and show that local growth what making it also attractive for international guys, but we also need to ease the doing business environment. It is wrong to have to wait sometimes, you know, for six months to get a company registered. And also, it is also really important to engage in travel, facilitate travel so that goods and services can move all around. It helps with tariffs because sometimes the tariffs around oil and gas products. That's something nobody talks about. But if you look at it, you see about 5 to 
of the net losses that you could get in an oil and gas operation, especially if you're an international company, it comes with the tariffs. You can't move goods, for example, look at the Gulf of Guinea. You can't move goods from Port Harcourt you, you, two hours into Malabo without dealing with customs and duties and everything. And you move into another operation in Angola, and that two hours, you do customs and duties and everything. These tariffs, these regulations, make it very difficult for people to operate and companies to operate. So a lot of money goes into, in, into bureaucracy, corruption takes up, but then business really suffers. So it's time for us to get back in the drawing board, but that's what's beautiful about, about Africa. We can do it. We can change that narrative and really build something and come out of this strong. So if, if we're going to come out of this strong, we need to get to work and we need to push it because this is a moment that can help us live up to the future. So what people see as a disaster, we can turn it to become a bonanza. Now I'm quite curious because you mentioned this. Does the heat get felt the same between um, indigenous companies that kind of form around the, 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 the all major ecosystem and the, the all majors already established outside of Africa and have operations that are more established in different places that are not as volatile as some of the uh, African countries. Do you think that the heat is being felt appropriately among all of them and coming out of this, who has more opportunity to really leverage on? I think the international majors have a bigger opportunity to really leverage on these more than local companies because we are stuck. We are small, we are local, and we're trying to work with a difficult environment. We don't have the big benefits of transfer pricing, using where you have better, better fiscal regimes to shore up others. We don't, we don't have the massive big load. But also, we also, I mean, look, look at African local companies. From what we see at the chamber, and we have a very vast network with African independent producers, African service happens with them. There is a big yeah, contract taken out when from narrative sometimes doesn't really work well for Africans because they don't own the ships, they don't own the big um, trading contracts, and they don't own the storage facilities. So they are really cash trapped and cash flow tight. That is a big issue for African for, for Afri um, African companies. So if we're looking at looking at some kind of bailouts, I mean most European countries provided bailouts to their sector. The African countries, what did we do? Sometimes we actually press the neck of the sector and say, give us more because governments need that, that money. In, and it's fair also in governments to really shop the economy. Look, if you look, if you go around the Permian area in the United States, what are they doing? They're saying, we need to get this to get the oil companies there. Because, and if you look at the, the tar sands in Canada, same thing. What is the basic issue that the um, bureaucrats and the business are saying, they're saying they're looking at jobs. It's about jobs. And so we in Africa have to look at that from a job perspective and say, most Africans don't work for the majors. They work for independent African companies, service companies. We need to shore them up because they are our first job creators, these small businesses, and we need to show that. And we need to create an environment for them to, to boost growth and them to stay in the game. So I'm not one of those who say, let's get rid of local content rules because it's it, it, during these times. No, let's incentivize growth. It's tough for African companies, but also here is a big advantage. It is our time to also get back to the drawing board, run better companies, cut out the waste, and still get the right kind of international partners, change the game a little bit, look at gas, and then diversify into other energy products that can make us competitive. Because we still have a billion people, I read a book, Billions at Play, about our billion continent with a lot, with a lot of potential that these local companies with what some of them have learned from their partnership and their sojourn with international companies, they can turn that around and really drive growth within Africa and you work well for our people. Going a bit further with this, uh, you, 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 you mentioned earlier with the proverbs about the two elephants fighting and the grass suffering. Uh, we've seen quite a number of examples where foreign policy affects African countries in a very large way, especially when they don't have uh, let's just say a very sizable voice in the decision making. Uh, very recently is the is the oil price war, and obviously that 
that that had a hand to play making a bad situation a lot more worse. And and we see it as well with with with, with bodies like the IAA. You've seen this uh, coronavirus as an opportunity to divest funding away from from fossil fuel projects. So I just want to talk a bit about how you see foreign foreign policy really playing in the development of the African oil and gas industry and what it really holds for the future in terms of the energy transition. I think it's all about foreign policy and you know the really smart people call it geopolitics. I don't know about that. But I, I think we need, to, we need to be very careful as an African continent. You got to use your weight, your potential to really drive your cause. I think we have in Africa been so quick to rely on foreign aid, which is basically nothing, and then sold out our strong position at the bargaining table. That means us not really driving forward our resources. The IEA, the, o, um, the um, OECD nations, and everything, they are going to push the agenda. The biggest question you have to ask is, what is our agenda? Do we have, are we creating that strong African voice to really put our agenda on the table? When you look at climate change issue, we should never deny or take lightly the damaging effects of climate change. It is real. And we all have to find ways to confront it. And we all have to be part of that, working with all parties to implement the Paris Accord and really drive them. But we have to really, we have to really accept, ask ourselves that question. What I was saying is that how do we African countries get really um, strong on an African agenda that is not colored or held back by a drive for aid? Our resources is our power at this moment and we need to use our resources to make sure that it benefits our people and it drives us it drives it, it drives it drives our position at the bargaining table i mean it's 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 easy it's just about negotiations and we need to negotiate better and if you the, the first thing right now is that the iea sits there they determine how this is going to be and these are good organizations the OECD, good organizations, climate change uh, activists, good people. But the case in India, you have to ask yourself right now is that how do we put an African narrative? How do we put African issues on board? What we have right now is people telling us, well, your African issues don't really matter. We'll give you some aid. We'll give you some, some handouts. And that should fit you. So I ask this question, how do people who have um, polluted 20, 30 times more than we have in Africa become the ones to provide, to lecture us on the solution today without asking our opinions and looking at our real development? I'm a kid who grew up in a small town, in a small city in Cameroon. And I tell you this, I know what it means going to bed without lights on. I know what it means not even having a cell phone. That was not even, a, that was not even an option or having a phone. I know what it means for a mother to, uh, or a sister to die at the hospital because there are no lights for a C-section. Energy poverty is real. That is something that we cannot negate. We can neglect that. And so, to start, and so we have to start dealing with these issues and create an African energy sector dealing with climate change that is sustainable. Sustainability is what Africans need. And you know, we're just talking about the oil industry and the market crash. You can, you're not going to run African industries with generators. We're going to have to need real energy to drive royal communities so that there's not a mass exodus into huge urban centers that create crime and everything. We're going to have to create jobs so my grandmother can stay in her local, in, in her village and still be part of an, a, 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 a new industry that grows around there. Those kind of discussions about real people, everyday people, everyday Africans, that, their voice has to be on that table and it has to matter. We can't let elites to drive this in a way that everyday Africans don't have a voice. That will be the worst kind of negotiation can't just be about let's put a few solar panels in a few places and give you some aid money, which ends up going back into Swiss banks, and then you think that you solve the problem. No. When we, when we push this, I'm fighting for my grandmother. 
I'm fighting for, 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 my, for my little sister in the village. I'm fighting for everyday people whom nobody hears their voice. Those guys who are rioting in the Niger Delta because they feel like the climate is it's bad and their villages, their agriculture, they can't do it. Those people who don't have a voice and those people who can be in the rooms that I can be. So I think we need to drive that voice. We need to put their concerns on the table and we need to go with a climate transition that creates jobs and builds for sustainable development and not drive just aid. Aid is not going to solve our problem. That is a very, 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 very strong statement. And I really appreciate you voicing it out quite eloquently. And now I'm curious, because a lot of the work that you're doing with Centurion and with the African Energy Chamber revolves around giving this voice to underrepresented groups. And I'm very curious to what's, what developments you're tracking with your organizations and what are you really looking at even before the coronavirus outbreak that really helps amplify these voices and put Africa in the right place to do business with and to thrive in the next few years. And also, what do you think companies can take away as kind of an outtake for the last few months of the coronavirus outbreak really affecting business? I think it has been very amazing. You'll be surprised the number of corporations that stand with us and that believe with us and work with us to find solutions. You'll be governments that stand with us and want to work solutions. We would not be doing this without the huge ear of governments or corporations. We've been very, very lucky. Always in this number of which people go into this business of demonizing corporations or demonizing governments. We say there's an alternative. What, what you cannot see is that, and I'm very happy with the work we've done. We've really gotten everybody together. People don't need to agree with us on anything, but they talk to us about everything. And I think what has been very important is being invited to OPEC meetings, sharing a, an African, from an African business perspective on the table. I was so um, glad, um, glad last year I participated in some of your um, round, um, closed our round table sessions at ADIPEC. It was very, very important to bring a different perspective and narrative there. And it, the, the issue is a lot of, when we talk about Africa, we have to see an Africa that is as diverse, as unique, and it's not a monolith, and it's not one country. But being able to really look at the entire continent and building a chamber that's basically become the voice of the African energy sector, but it's to encompass everything. I have learned so much as I have contributed in, in, in this energy development, written and by it. But I also think that we have to look at the long term. As an African, I see a lot of problems that happen around our continent comes from our natural resources and our land. And we have to find solutions that people who never thought, who felt counted out, that nobody ever gave them a chance that they're part of this. Our investors, oil companies, um, banks, and uh, people building power projects, they are a critical component of Africa's energy future as, as anything. We have to continue attracting oil companies. We got to start changing our narrative to drive more gas because with gas, we can go into power and everything. We got to start talking to oil companies and build those partnerships to say, we can use your technology and your knowledge sharing and that you come with local companies so that we can work together on gas flooring and curb carbon emissions because it's really important. We can shift away from coal and power our communities with renewables so that we can use real renewables, but even while we're doing renewables, use young Africans. They are so young, they're so bright, they have technology, they can they embrace technology. I mean, some of these guys got three, four um, WhatsApp numbers and cell phones, they got Twitter. They, I, I mean, I'm so old, these guys, they start calling, they don't call it Instagram anymore, they just call it the gram or IG. You take this power and these bright people and you say, you can drive renewable energy panels, solar panels, and new grids to really turn this around and build it. That is what we have to start focusing on. You cannot love jobs and hate those who create jobs. We have to really show our business because business does have a way, especially now with the virus, to really help transform our economy. But we got to hold them accountable. They got to pay their taxes. But we got to still come into governments and say, Create that enabling environment so these young, 
people around Africa and can really drive and shape an Africa that we all can be proud of. This is a place where most people just call it Africa. A lot of us call it home. And if you call something home, you got to fix it because we are not going to be able to really defend our natural resources if we don't meet the challenging times that we, feel we meet right now with technology. But what's, I mean, I don't understand what's wrong with us not really looking at the upstream oil and gas sector and saying, let's find different ways to use cleaner, more efficient ways to power our upstream oil and gas platforms, FPSOs. Those kind of transitions, you start that right now and you build a culture around it. And that culture now becomes so transparent, some of the ills that has really, really kept our industry and our content behind, like corruption and mismanagement, we start developing a new culture that embraces it and drive us to where we have to be. We are not going to have the Africa we deserve if we don't put these things forward and really drive it. Because, you know, people want to blame other people for where we are and say, this happened in the past and everything. The past is reference, not residence. Somebody they might be responsible for you being down, but they're not responsible for you not getting back up. It's up to you to roll up your sleeves and get right back up. And when we start building, we need to start talking about post-COVID. Because post-COVID, the tough issues, unemployment is going to be there. Jobs are going to be gone. Contracts are going to be gone. We're going to have to restart our economies again. Young people, more young people, they've lost their education. They've lost so much. So much of them being out. They don't even know. And then health issues. They hope that, uh, that, that they, were, they, they felt going into 2020 all dashed away. So you see that we need to start pulling that together. And I think we all have an obligation to do that. You can't be a true African and somebody who lost natural resources in the oil and gas industry without pondering this. That is where the chamber is going. That is where we want to drive it with our corporate partners and our government partners. But we need to bring people whom nobody talk about. You know, it's like, I remember going to Sunday school as a kid, they talked about the rejected stone. You know, we need to turn this rejected the stone to stones to become the cornerstones of our development and that's what we focus on thank you very much mr Ayub. i really enjoyed this conversation and i hope we have another chance to have you on here thank you so much for your insights and it's a pleasure to have a representative of the african energy chamber here with us thank you so much and uh corona or no corona i'll be at adipec this year thank <laughs> you so much. lovely we look forward to seeing you